Let's get some more detail on what is happening in the world of politics and beyond. Ross Clark, the journalist and author, is with us. Afternoon to you, Ross. Good afternoon. Hi. Always nice to have you with us. A few stories to get through here. Let's start with the Tory leadership thing. Uh, six of them there vying for the big job at number 10. It's a Kemi versus, well, it might be Kemi versus Robert because they're the two front runners. I want to give, give everybody a brief reminder of what either or both of them have been saying in their campaign to become leader of the Conservative Party. Firstly, Kemi Badnock. We talked right but governed left. We talked right Sounding but like governed conservatives. left. Sounding but acting like conservatives. Like conservatives. But acting like government Labour. Government should do fewer things. Government should do better. fewer and things. It does, it but better. Do brilliance. And what it does, it should do with brilliance. So that's her. And this is the other man who's also up there as one of the front runners. He's Robert Jenrick. Anyone who comes here, anyone who comes here illegally, should be deported within hours and days, not weeks and months. That is the will of the British people. The big question, Ross, of course, is that can any of them, any of the six, beat Keir Starmer come 2029? Um, well, I think they could do. And I think people, I mean, the tendency is just to ignore the Tory leadership election as a sort of irrelevance, as a sort of little fight between uh, members of a party that doesn't really matter anymore. But, um, you know, look, Labour appear to have this massive majority of 170 but it was won on 34% of the vote. When um, Tony Blair had a majority of around 170, he won it on sort of like 41, 42% yeah. of the vote. Um, Keir Starmer is not a popular leader. He might appear to be if you look at the parliamentary arithmetic, but um, he's already offended a, a large number of elderly people by withdrawing the... Uh, um, the, the winter fuel allowance, there's um, huge tax rises on their way, it seems, and that's not just a problem because ta people don't like tax rises. It's a very big political problem because Labour sort of denied there were any great tax rises in, in the pipeline when Rishi Sunak said Labour's planning £2,000 tax mm. rises per household over four years. Labour said, no, no, rubbish, complete yeah. rubbish. We're not planning that. But it now it looks as if we'll be extremely lucky to get away with um, uh, tax rises of only £500 a year so um there's lots of snares there for the government and i don't think the next election is a foregone conclusion by any means yeah i do wonder what's going on sometimes and you will know this ross you have to you sort of have to really have a look at some of the advisors around ministers i was looking at an area that you know well ed miliband's department uh where i, I can't remember his full title is he the net zero Bizarre. Energy security and net zero. That's that's him. Um, and okay, put aside just Ed himself, who I don't really think knows much about this stuff. But the people around him, I mean, this is a cartel of kind of it, it's a sort of a Marxist dream team advising him over there. These are hard, proper forthright extremists in the world of climate change, right? And we just lost Ross on that point. Government, no. Oh, we, we got, we got you the... back, Ross. Sorry, we lost you for a second. Oh, right, sorry. I was yeah. talking okay. about Team Ed. What do you make of it? Hear you, so... And Ross has just dropped out on that point. We're going to get Ross back. Uh, Ross Clark is back with us. I was just, uh, I don't even know how we got into that issue of Ed Miliband now, Ross. Um, it seems an age ago, but I was just talking about the people that surround ministers and how it's as, just as important to really look at who their advisors are to get a flavour of the direction of travel. Um, and Ed Miliband is certainly a man that knows how to surround himself with a lot of people who you might call are on very much part of the Church of Net Zero. Yes, indeed. And uh, what's another thing that's really li liable to bring Labour down is Ed Miliband's promise to uh, save us £300 a year on our energy bills, um, you know, because he claims renewable energy is cheaper. Well, I mean, for, for start, um, energy bills are just going to go up by 150 quid in October. Yeah. If you're a pensioner, you've lost your... Um, uh, you lost your winter fuel allowance, um, that's going to be another extra 300 quid, up to 300 quid on your energy bills. So he's not doing very well on that at the moment. And this £300 a year claim was made by a think tank called Ember, which is funded by um, all kinds of um, environmental organisations. And yep. in the middle of 2023, put out this claim that 
if Britain went to some ninety eight percent renewable energy, renewable electricity, it would save the average household three hundred pound a year. But it was based on twenty twenty three prices when gas prices were very high and um renewables it still seem to be quite low well what's happened since then is that gas prices have fallen back um a, a long long way yeah. whereas um the uh, wind and solar prices have increased substantially and we, we just had this auction today for new wind and solar um farms and um you know the the prices that are now being offered long-term guaranteed prices for 15 years offered to wind farm owners, for example, about sort of 50% up on what they were a couple of years ago. Wow. So, you know, that's a sign of renewable energy. It, it sort of, it was great when um, interest rates were low and commodities prices were down. And um, what we saw was year on year falls in, um, uh, you know, prices of building wind turbines and solar farms. But that has finished now with a jolt and, you know, the costs of building wind and solar farms and the costs will come up on up front with the, these kind of projects um you know the the, the prices are going up now and it's hard to see that they're it, gonna well i was going to say i mean let's well, we were going to talk about that story anyway so let, let's just look at it now if we can ross nine offshore wind farm projects awarded in the uk auction um the government have to be seen to be doing this now because they put so much into it is this this is relevant is, is this part of the gb energy plan what 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 or is this largely a separate thing what's the deal here um no this is all part of the plan to get us to um you know zero carbon electricity grid by 2030 and so virtually everyone says that's impossible to do um gary smith the general secretary of the gmb union who's um very close to labor obviously mm and um you know represents workers in this business he says it can't be done and what the big problems i mean you can build a wind farm you can build a solar farm but yeah. it's connecting it to the grid and um you know for years and years we've just been building more and more wind and solar capacity without really um you know providing the infrastructure to connect it to the grid and we saw this um last week um or last month uh, Great, great new wind farm opened on the Shetland Islands and um, it had to sort of throw away, discard 60% of the energy it could have um, generated because it simply there was simply not the capacity there in the grid. And um, consumers are paying for that. We've all paid two sure. and a half million pounds to this new wind farm not to generate electricity. And... Um, <laughs> You know, <laughs> you can't make this stuff up. I mean, these, these new these contracts they reckon are going to uh, fuel eleven million homes, Ross. Well, yes, so on a sunny and windy day. But the other problem, of course, is storage. And um, if you look at the trying to construct a electricity grid that's based on wind and solar, it's no good just looking at the price of the wind and solar itself. Yeah. You've got to also look at the price of storage or what backup you're going to have when those um, wind and solar farms aren't delivering the goods. And um, there's just been very, very little work on this in, in the past few years at all. I mean, we, we have some energy storage facilities which were built between these sort of pump storage reservoirs built between the 1960s and the 1980s. But between them, they're capable of storing about an hour's worth of um, UK electricity use. All we've had a few in the last few years, we had a few of these lithium battery installations. Well, between them, they are capable of storing less than five minutes worth of electricity use um, in, in Britain. So. Yeah. You know, you, we, we just do not have a viable system to support a grid which is based on these intermittent um, re sources of renewables in wind and solar. Indeed. Um, and we are. We, it's going to be fascinating to see how the government are going to wangle out of this one over the, the, the next two or three years. Um, just a word on immigration. Uh, I mentioned at the beginning 10 people have died in the channel today. It's not the first time this has happened. More than 50 people needed rescuing with medical treatment. This, of course, is bound to happen because neither uh, France have been woeful, the United Kingdom have been horrific, and the Labour Party, it seems to me, Ross, are saying... 
all my, I, I said when we lost your line a moment ago, it's, I don't sense it's in their DNA to sort this. And the most you hear from Keir Starmer or Yvette Cooper is that they're going to sort of smash the gangs, smash the gangs, as if no one's ever tried that before. Of course, well, I think what people want to see is some effective response to the actual problem as it's happening. People on boats try to cross the channel for their own safety, if nothing else. Mm -hmm. Yeah, of course. I mean, this does absolute tragedy. Um, it's that we've 25 people until today had been killed in, in trying to cross the channel this year. There's an, seems like there's another mm. 10 today. Um, you know, it's absolute tragedy and it's caused by um, people traffickers putting people on unseaworthy boats, putting them across the channel on the pretext that, well, they'll be rescued and taken to Britain and then all will be well. And of course, it's not always well because yeah. um, it's a danger. You know, this is one of the busiest shipping lanes in the world. There are um, it's very stormy. There's wakes from the boats and so on. And yep. you're, a lot of these boats don't even get sort of more than a couple of miles from Calais before they get into trouble. Yeah. But it could be stopped so very easily if Britain and France would get together and say, look, anyone who arrives in Dover, anyone who's picked up in the channel, they are going to be taken straight back to France. Then, you know, it becomes an unviable route for people, traffickers. Mm. And um, but, you know, the trouble is we're, we're paying France, you know, 500 million pounds or something. Um, it, to, it's it's, uh, it's, ridic it's ridiculous. These boats and they're not doing it. And I heard, I, I think it was Jenrick today say, uh, or what was it, Tugan? I can't, I can't remember which one said it, but it might not have been today, but one of them, one of the leadership contenders said, you know, we want to be able to deport people not in, uh, in, in hours and days, not weeks and months. And I thought, well, it's not even weeks and months, it's absolutely years. Well, it is. I mean, you, we get into this sort of um, legal no-man's land. You know, you get these, um, uh, um, you know, even when migrants' cases are rejected, they they so then allow to appeal, mm. and this happened with the Liverpool bomber who had, you know, the, his name was Emad, wasn't it? Which was rather um, unfortunate, but um, <laughs> he was, um, you know, he his uh, the border agency sniffed out his, um, you know, that he was telling fibs straight away and rejected his case. And, but he, you know, he should have been deported at that well, point. You, at that, uh, literally deal, at that he? point, we rejected your case. Sorry, mate, come with us. We're off to the yeah. airport, fella. And that, that would be well, the end of That's where it that. goes but wrong. Then for some reason, there's a protracted, uh, another set of circumstances that, that surround it. It is madness. Listen, Ross, always a pleasure. Thank you, sir. Ross Clark, he is the author and journalist with us, looking at the big political stories of the day.